last lecture of the um, Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy for this year. Uh, we have, uh, however, a whole series of lectures lined up for you for next year in which we continue our series on the rule of law. And let me welcome uh, Professor Martin Krieger as our speaker uh, tonight and um, introduce him very briefly uh, before I give him the word. Thank you very much for being with us despite uh, essays which have to be turned in, but more than that, despite the fact that there is an institute Christmas party on at the cafeteria. So I'm very happy that some of you have found your way here rather than there, or maybe have been there before and are now here. Um, Martin Krieger is the Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Theory at the University of New South Wales in uh, Sydney. He's also co-director of the Network for Interdisciplinary Studies uh, of Law uh, there. He's adjunct professor both at ANU's um, program Regnet, but also a visiting professor at the Graduate School of Social Research in Warsaw, from where I think he's just come. Um, and he is a, a recurrent uh, visiting professor in Onyati at the International Institute of the Sociology of Law. He's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences. He is an editor of a number of very, very important journals in the field, among them the Hague Journal, the Rule of Law, <coughs> uh, Hague Journal on the Rule of Law, and the Annual Review of Law and Social Science. In 2016, he received the prestigious uh, Dennis Leslie Mahoney Prize in Legal Theory, awarded by the Julius Stone Institute of Jurisprudence at the University of Sydney for his writings in general, but in particular for his book on Philip Selznick, um, in uh, which I think, uh, for those of you who would need uh, an introduction to Selznick's work, I cannot recommend something more uh, important than uh, Martin's book here, because what he does is he not only traces uh, the development of his thought, but also looks at the, um, his preoccupations, but also his unique insights and a very distinctive moral intellectual sensibility, which marks Selznick's work. So this would be uh, really a wonderful introduction if you would like to pursue uh, that. Martin's own writings are concerned with some of the very same questions, um, and they explore the moral characters and consequences of large institutions, of law, of state, of bureaucracy. Uh, his book, Civil Passions, is a selection of his essays, which deals with broad questions of politics and society, both in Australia, but also in Eastern Europe. He has been working on Eastern Europe, particularly Poland, for a number of years, and we're probably going to hear something of that uh, when he deals with the larger topic of the rule of law, which has been a preoccupation of his since many years. He's worked on its nature, its conditions, its challenges, on the prospects of rule of law after 1989 in um, uh, Eastern Europe, but not only there, in post-dictatorships, in post-conflict conditions, in what we may call politically scarred societies. Tonight's lecture addresses the question of rule of law by asking a really fundamental question, what is the point of the rule of law? And I think what he wants to talk about there, if I may second guess, is what is at stake in the debates on the rule of law? Because the rule of law has had, as you know, a rather checkered career. So after 90, a really um, great amount of consensus and celebration of the rule of law, particularly after the fall of the Iron Curtain, and what we are witnessing today, but not only in Eastern Europe, in many other parts of the world, an attack on uh, the rule of law. Uh, the nature of uh, rule of law and its conditions need to be uh, determined, but the threats to it, some of them are old, some of them are new, uh, and we need to understand what is at stake in this entire debate. And I think we're going to rethink with Martin this evening what is the point of the rule of law. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and you have the word, Martin. Thank you, Shalini, and thank you all for tearing yourself away from the party 
I would have found it a very difficult thing to do, and I'm glad that you're, you're able to do. Shannon promised a brief introduction, and after the introduction that she's given, it's downhill all the way from there. It's very hard to live up to it, but I'll do what I can. Uh, I am delighted and honoured, actually, to be speaking here, both because to be associated with the Hirschman name in any way is a delight, and to be associated with the centre whose activities I've once participated in and have observed for some time is in itself an honour. Also, the topic of this series, Dismantling the Rule of Law, is a particularly apt one for the moment we're in, and I am going to, in the last part of my talk, try to address the relationship of the account I give of the point of rule of law to what's going on. I think more broadly, but my remarks will be focused on Poland, since I know it best, and I left there yesterday, and every time you come to Poland for a new time, there's some dramatic event occurring, or at least when I come, I'm as even worried that I might be causing these events. When I come, there's some new and dramatic event that no one expected the day before. And as it was when I was there in July, so it is again when I've been, here in, uh, been there in the last few weeks. And I'll try to relate some of these recent events uh, in the tail end of my talk. As Shalini said, and as is indisputable because it's up there, my topic is what's the point of the rule of law, which is not the same, and in fact the difference is crucial to everything I have to say, it's not the same as the more conventional question that begins discussions of the rule of law typically, that is, what is the rule of law? The difference between starting with the, first, with, with the question, what is the point of the rule of law, and starting with the question, what is the rule of law, is really key to everything that I have to say. Uh, not because I'm a conceptual analyst and I think this word or that word matters, but just because I think one can't seriously think about the sorts of questions that people do think about in the rule of law by starting in the conventional spot. I want to move the starting point one step backwards. Maybe, if I'm lucky, also one step forwards. We'll see. My remarks really have three moments. The first is I will... Uh, arrogantly try to suggest some f common features to the huge number of disparate accounts of rule of law that we are uh, acquainted with at the moment. I'll say that notwithstanding their differences, there are some things they have in common, and those things are I don't like. Seem to me uh, these common features are way, bad ways of coming into thinking about the rule of law. So the first part of my talk is to lay out the enemy and then try to shoot. Though some of them are friends, I mean, so the enemy is, it's not a matter of blood here, it's just intellectual difference. The second part of the talk is to lay out the truth, that is, what I believe. And that will be the, an alternative and that will be focused on thinking about what the point of the rule of law is, and then what some of the implications of that way of thinking might be. And thirdly and finally, I'll try to answer Kant's question, well that's okay, he didn't quite say okay, but that's okay in theory, but what about practice, by uh, trying to bring some of these reflections to bear on current uh, challenges to the rule of law. My examples will come from Poland and to some lesser extent from Hungary, but I think some of them are quite generalizable, and I rise, raise them both because they are important and because I know something about Poland, so why, not, why waste that knowledge, but also because uh, one could think, and many people I think do think, that what is happening in Poland and Hungary and other uh, occasions of what has been called by David Landau uh, abusive constitutionalism really fit better the account I'm challenging than my own account. Of course, that's completely wrong, and so I have to show that it's wrong. But it's plausible. So those are the three parts. So let me start with, it, 
the enemy. Uh, the rule of law is a lawyer's concept. They started it in England. In particular, that phrase was not coined, but launched in its modern path by a 19th, early 20th century constitutional writer, Albert Dicey. And again and again, it's lawyers or legal philosophers who are really parasites on lawyers. They get their information, they have their point of view from lawyers. This is the source of intelligence we have about the rule of law. And it's not a surprise. I mean, if you want to know about plumbing, you ask plumbers. If you want to know about teeth, you ask dentists. So a common general assumption seems to me plausible, but not completely fortunate. If you want to know about the rule of law, you should ask lawyers. And if you do ask lawyers, there are two things. Now that the rule of law has become, as it has become over the last 30 years, a hurrah term of extraordinary resonance. Nobody now says, like Lenin, the dictatorship of the proletariat, that is his, his regime, is the rule of force unrestrained by any laws. Now, he was not apologizing for that. He was boasting of it. He said there was a reason for it. But that is not the way modern despots talk. They claim to be fulfilling the ambitions of the rule of law, albeit in a more perfect, better, uh, better adapted, more, less corrupt manner than their enemies used to. So the term has had this extraordinary resonance over the last uh, 30 years, and there are, I believe, not accidental reasons for that, which I'd be happy to talk about in Q&A, but uh, I'll leave them behind at the moment. That is the fact. That the rule of law has joined those uh, iconic terms which have, in, like democracy, justice, equality, which have in common that, first of all, everybody seems to be for them, and their opponents have no vocal constituency. They can't say, among the things we're keen to do is kick the rule of law out of here. That's not what's said. Now, in that context, the contribution, the common contribution of lawyers and legal philosophers seems to me, or the common elements in their contributions, disparate though they are, to be two things. One is that the answer, they ask the question, let me say three things. They ask the question, what is the rule of law? And their answer has these two elements. One is that the answer is to be found in the specification of institutional elements of central official legal systems. You want to know what the rule of law is? You get a list. Dicey, who I mentioned, had a list of three elements. Rawls had four elements. Kassunstein had seven elements. Uh, the great influences of contemporary analytic philosophy discussion of, of rule of law, Lon Fuller, Joseph Raz, uh, John Finnis, had eight. Uh, Lord Bingham had eight. The, the contemporary philosopher who has criticized this, these laundry lists, Jeremy Waldron, criticizes their lists, but he can't resist to add his own. And his has, I think also, no, it has 10. It has 10. The record, as he points out, is the American philosopher Robert Summers, who has 18. 18 elements of legal institutions. Separation of powers is often going to be found, the independence of the judiciary and many other features or of legal rules. They should be clear, they should be public, they should be prospective, they should be consistent with each other, and so on. Now, if you're deeply immersed in the game, you can fight for your life for this list, or maybe that list, or maybe an amended list. And you can, the, the literature of legal philosophy and, and law is full of these uh, duels of lists. List, actually. So, sorry, I won't go. Uh, now, one way of starting a lecture here is say, well, my list is different. But I don't want us to do that because I think that this is a mistaken way of thinking, of starting to think about the rule of law. And I'll say some reasons why I think it's at least unfortunate and there are reasons for suspicion of it. I said there's one point, there are two answers to the question. The one is that it's in terms of features of legal institutions and legal rules and all legal rules. The second is, particularly when the rule of law became an export commodity in the rule of law promotion industry, where it was assumed by many things 
that one list or another list was what was appro appropriate to be transported, exported to anybody who had any country that had a need for the rule of law. So this sense that there are central features of the rule of law and they are of at least empirically generalizable significance. Like, if you want to drive a car, start with wheels that are round. It's always good to have round wheels. So, similarly in relation to the rule of law, it's been thought that you can focus on, you can find certain institutional features of law which do the work of the rule of law wherever they can be set. There are going to be problems starting the rule of law as a establishing building, which is an unfortunate metaphor, maybe should be a more organic metaphor, growing, grafting, praying, uh, might be more appropriate to the character of the task. But these two features seem to me very common, and I think that they're both suspicious. Now, the reasons for suspicion are some, I'll mention five. First, notwithstanding the uh, billions of dollars and the thousands of hugely intelligent people employed by scores at least of powerful organizations, World Bank, United Nations, many others, or the activities of people uh, developing rule of law indexes of various sorts, the Heritage Foundation, uh, the, the um, Liberty, F not the Liberty Fund, whatever it's called, uh, the L Law and Justice Project, Notwithstanding all of this activity by a lot of intelligent, devoted people, not too many people boast of great success in their endeavours in developing, building the rule of law. If you think of Afghanistan, maybe I'm serving my own purposes because it's not an easy case, uh, the rule of law has not been effectively built in Afghanistan, but even in easier cases. In Burma, where I do a lot of work, uh, it's... Uh, the story is not phenomenally positive, and that can be generalised. So often we have what some colleagues of Duval's called isomorphic mimicry, isomorphic mimicry, where uh, once you've digested the language, you find we've copied the forms, but what these forms do in alien places, in different places, is very different from anything that we expected to go with those forms. Now, the second, so ineffectiveness is a problem. So is change. Uh, we should have thought that this would be a problem because both institutions and the problems that they are supposed to deal with are constantly changing and constantly different among places and time, even at the same time. So if Aristotle is taken as, a for, as an ancestor of concern with the rule of law, somebody that we should take seriously, it's not because he had some institutional blueprint that we would like to adopt in modern societies. Even Montesquieu, much more recent, wasn't, isn't looked at again in his praise of moderate government because he got in some specific, tangible, particular sense institutions that are good, good to travel. So states change, states know more, states do more. Problems change, and these are huge, huge uh, sources of the dynamic of state development and legal development, and, and why should one be surprised? I mean, of course that's the case. More troubling in recent years is that it's not just change that we find, it's complicity. That is, many of the institutions involved, uh, lauded by rule of law advocates have not been resistant and some are often complicit in attempts by new populist authoritarians to subvert values traditionally associated with the rule of law. And so you have now a literature of uh, what I mentioned before, David Landau's nice term, not nice but interesting, abusive constitutionalism, where the constitutions in many countries, in Latin America his specialty, but in Eastern Europe, my interest, are found to be very congenial, adaptable, useful to activities and institutional reforms which sustain 
anti, well, activities hostile to the values which animated rule of law efforts, which animated often these very institutions. Other writers talk in a similar vein of stealth authoritarianism, of uh, legal autocracy. They're all dealing with this phenomenon, not entirely new, but still surprising, of law not being antithetical to uh, authoritarian subversion, but useful to it. There's a revival of an interest in a remarkable book of the 1930s, The Dual State, by the German-Jewish refugee from Nazism and Frankel, where he talked about Nazism not as state, as lawless, as many people do talk about authoritarian and totalitarian rule, but as incorporating a not completely distorted version of the Reichstag which preceded the Nazi takeover. Not completely distorted, at least for the five years before Frankel had to flee Nazi Germany in 1938. So complicity, if the very forms that are typically associated with the answer to the question, what is the rule of law, are complicit in the subversion of the values that we wanted to think about it for, then we have a real problem. And the fifth, I think it's fifth anyway, the next uh, and last concern that I have is what I might call the pointlessness of much discussion of the rule of law. I mean that in two senses. In a general sense, observers of, bu of bureaucracies, of institutions, are familiar with the term goal displacement, where a bureaucrat knows the rules but has forgotten or never even thought of what these rules might conduce, conduce to. So you have a formalistic uh, insistence on adherence to rules, even though what rationale those rules might be, therefore, is long disappeared. And more concerning to me, in many countries which are the recipients of rule of law packages and promotion and assistance, is that for many people who may clamour for the rule of law, their concern has very little, at least at any immediate level, to do with the institutions that lawyers talk about. The character of legislation, clear, prospective, etc. The way people will find themselves treated in central, often high, criminal courts. Because the fate of many people in many countries in the world is that the state either is not at the centre of the action, and so its laws are not at the centre of the action, or that the state is too much at the centre of the action, and uh, law seems to many citizens, as it does to their rulers, to be irrelevant to the way that power affects them in their daily lives, in their ordinary lives. It's not for them a legal technical matter. It's not a matter of how some uh, drafting procedure has been followed or not followed. It is the fact, the social fact, the social fact, but of course it's also a political fact, even if it is or isn't a legal fact, that their lives are affected by power in uncomfortable, often tragic ways. And so I want to think I want to suggest that the way we start by asking the question, what is the rule of law, and then giving some institutional package as an answer, is an inadequate way. Its inadequacies can be observed by the lack of successes that I'm, I've just talked about. But I think, uh, philosophically, the problem is deeper. The concept of the rule of law is not like the beautiful picture I saw in, in, in Krakow yesterday, uh, Da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine. That's in a good in itself. You don't have to think, well, what was this for? What will it do for the GDP? You don't think that. This is good in itself. The rule of law, for all its beauty, is not that beautiful. We want the rule of law because we think there is a problem that the rule of law, or there are problems, that we want rule of law to help us solve, or at least... Uh, uh, Lesson. In, in the term, a nice term, invented, but not invented. Anyway, maybe invented. 
by the legal philosopher I've mentioned already, Jeremy Waldron, rule of law is a solution concept. Now, it's a, it's a pro, it's a, it puts us our attention to something which we hope is a solution to a serious problem. Now, if it's that sort of concept, it seems to me that it's not just uh, a good idea. It seems to me the only way to do is to say, well, first, what is the problem? That's the place to start. And even if you don't like or agree with or think adequate, my answer to that question, I would try to defend. And I would say, all right, well, we just have to agree to disagree. On this starting point, start by thinking about what is the problem for which people have for very long time, so I'm not original, of the, and, I, and that at least I take to be a virtue in this context, I'm not trying to be original, I'm trying to say over generations, if we mention Aristotle, if we mention Montesquieu, we're mentioning about people, mentioning people who have certain common concerns. There's a certain problem which arguably is perennial. Maybe an anarchist thinks that after the revolution or a communist, you won't have this problem, but wait and see. In the meantime, over millennia, a recurrent issue which has disturbed some people, not everyone, is how power is exercised. Power is a domain, is a, is a resource that can be concentrated, can be uh, huge, and can have both salutary and devastating effects. Salutary because unlike Friedrich Hayek who thinks that the real issue is to limit power, I don't think that. I think that the real issue is to temper power so that its salutary activities, keeping the peace, uh, so requiring public servants to do publicly oriented things, many other things, its salutary effects can be uh, increased and its devastating effects can be minimised. So I could be just talking about abuse of power, but that's huge. So let me limit it in the language that is common in rule of law discussions to say that the problem which has been so perennial and so remarked upon by people in many cultures at many times is one of arbitrary power. And that's, there's no news there, a lot of people have said it. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only game in town, it's not, I, it, it's, Constraint or tempering of arbitrary power is a good, it's not the only good we want, but it's a huge good. It's a sort of foundational good because if arbitrary power is part of your world, so I want to say, to that extent, you're in a sadder world than you might otherwise be. Now, a lot of people talk about arbitrary power, but then the practice is, I know this internally because I've done it often, to say arbitrary power and then to say, but this is not a highly or well theorised term, and then hope that by that confession, people won't ask you, well, what do you mind? But then you duck and you just keep using the same. So I'll, I'm not a philosopher, so I won't try to ransack and, and fillet the concept. I just mention three kinds of exercise of power which lend themselves and have been found by traditions and of thinkers about rule of law to conduce to arbitrariness in the exercise of power. The first is uncontrolled power. And it, there's a nice book by John Philip Reed just called The Rule of Law, which is about the English common law's conception of the rule of law from at least the 13th century when uh, the first compiler of the common law, Bracton, talked about the rule of law as the bridle of the king. The king was superior to all of us with, um, I don't want to say, I don't want to offend anyone here, but that was the story, that superior to everyone else. But not even the king should exercise uncontrolled power. There was a higher law or there was God or there was something which would temper, must temper power. And uncontrolled power is one moment or modulation of power which many people think very quickly leads to arbitrariness in its exercise. A second, which is taken up by analytical legal philosophers who talk about the rule of law, like the ones I've mentioned, Long Fuller, 
uh, Joseph Rez and others, is unpredictable power or unreliable power. And when they ask for power to be clear, open, public, prospective, not retrospective, not so vague that it could mean anything, they're all talking about that. People are to be guided by the law, and if the law is so vague or not unknown, you can't guide by it, and so its effect on you in any particular circumstance comes of you like lightning, out of the blue. And a third moment, which is introduced, I think, by the man I've mentioned twice now, Jeremy Waldron, is unrespectful power. When power is strong enough that it can imprison you, that it can fine you, that it can hit you in the teeth in various sorts of real and metaphorical ways, then you should have had a chance to contest its exercise, the basis on which it was exercised, to bring your case before it. These are standard legal virtues, praised often. What is interesting in, in, in Waldron's account is to say that they reflect, or they, they, they are, yes, they reflect a deep moral concern that we treat people, even before the law, as subjects rather than, as, as persons, rather than, as he put it once, uh, dilapidated houses or rabbit dogs. Now I think, in fact, his focus, as it turns out to be, just on courts is a mistake. Uh, we don't want unrespectful power in many contexts of life and from many sources of it. But uh, I think the moral insight is an important one. So these are my three examples of conditions that we should worry about because they lend themselves to arbitrary use of power. Now what's so bad about arbitrary power? In Poland, the ruler, incidentally, interestingly, not the premier, not the president, but the unappointed ruler of Poland is a small man with a large ambition called Jarosław Kaczynski. And he is known for his condemnation of what he called, under the previous government, which he uh, defeated in 2015, state impossibilism. And what he means by that is states are so hemmed in by legal constraints that they can't do what they should do. And part of what, and these legal constraints he believes are, are operated by uh, people involved in, in corrupt networks, and he's going to abolish those networks, he's going to uh, attack the castes of lawyers which to to throw off the shackles of impossibilism. And of course, he's only a modern uh, exponent of this view. This was what was in St uh, Lenin's remark, which I quoted earlier. It was not out of some, it may have been with Stalin, it wasn't with Lenin out of some desperate need just to have the power to, for personal psychological reasons. It was a belief that this was the only way in which an emancipated future could be uh, generated. And enlightened despots and unenlightened despots have often said that no one should get in their way. And a lot of human history has been that nobody did get in their way. So why this hostility to arbitrary power? Well, there's an old cliche now, it wasn't when he came to it, which is part of the answer, everybody knows. Lord Act in the 19th century, all power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely. But that's just the beginning. Judith Schlar, a great uh, uh, political theorist at, at Harvard and, and mentor of one of your previous speakers in this series, Stephen Holmes, spoke and lauded what she called the liberalism of fear. That is, a liberalism which sought to erect situ institutions and possibilities which d would diminish the routine possibility of fear in public life. This was for her so important, putting violence first as the enemy and thinking about how to constrain it, that she thought this was the number one priority of political and legal arrangements. 
And many people have talked that language. Fear is a terrible thing to have as a constant companion to your public life. Of course, you can never eliminate, nor should you eliminate it completely. But where you have good reasons for it, simply because anyone can do anything to you, or some people can do whatever they like to you, in ways that you can't predict and which treat you without respect, then you are rightly uh, likely to be horrified. And a third reason to worry about arbitrary power is that it is it contradicts the possibility of freedom. And it does that, of course, when you're thrown into jail for no good reason. But as the civic republican tradition, exemplified at the moment by Philip Pettit, has pointed out, the thing about arbitrary power is that you are not free, and anyway, this is their argument, no, I'm, I find it plausible, you're not free even if it's not exercised against you, but could be. So if you are the wife of a husband who is authorised or anyway permitted to treat you any which way, there are no limits on what he can do to you, but he happens not to do that, well then you're lucky, but you're only lucky. You're not free because you're subject to domination. The circumstances that might restrain that possibility are not available to you. If you're a slave and your slave owner similarly treats you kindly, good. That's better than the other. But it's not freedom. So these accounts, these reasons for hostility to arbitrary power seem to me to go deep. It's also a, a larger philosophical point. There is no way in which power holders can treat you with dignity, as a bearer of dignity, if they simply can uh, abuse you without warning, without control, without any regard for you as a person. Now these are all, and they're the common reasons that people have, and they're good reasons, to worry about, to fear arbitrary power. But there's another reason which goes in a different direction. Again, Stephen Holmes has pointed this out. Arbitrary po power holders are, but not necessarily for genetic reason, stupider than those power holders who are required to act within certain constraints, what Holmes calls enabling constraints. They focus activity on, ideally, they focus activity on what power holders should be authorised to do, and they uh, restrain the possibility of activities that power holders shouldn't be able to do. In fact, it's not just stupidity. Craziness is an available option with arbitrary power much more easily than with a power which is constrained. Anybody who has had the privilege of walking down the main boulevard in, in, uh, in Bucharest, uh, where 40,000 people were thrown out of their homes in 24 hours, where the boulevard is huge, leading to, as a guide will still tell you, the second biggest public building in the world after the Pentagon, will know that something crazy was happening there. If you've also had the privilege of visiting Burma's capital, Myanmar's capital city, Naypyidaw, erected in secrecy, full of, like a Disneyland in the jungle, with, full of huge boulevards that can, with 16 lanes but no cars uh, to which government was transplanted over a weekend will know that a certain sort of military uh, way of ordering things which has no constraint, no opposition, no informed criticism is a bad way to go. And so for all these reasons I suggest that the problem with which one should start thinking about the rule of law as part of a solution is arbitrary power. Of course it could be other things, but that's enough for me. If we've done that, we've done something. If we've restrained that, we've... Now how should we think about that? Here more briefly, the tradition typically is to use negative language. Of course Hayek does, limiting power, but so does Schlar. So do many people who've talked about uh, constraining, curbing, blocking, limiting power. And that is an important component. The circumstances of politics so often are full of so much catastrophic abuse of power that thinking that there have to be limits and constraints is important. 
But I'd also like to keep in mind, or like us to keep in mind, anyway, I'm going to keep in mind, uh, the H Holmes's notion of enabling constraints. It was an accident, maybe, but it was, in retrospect, uh, indicative that the Soviet Union and its satellites collapsed without being pushed. That's an extraordinary thing to happen. It doesn't often happen. And these were, as we all knew, and as their, their, their subjects, not citizens, their subjects knew, these were hugely powerful states. But they were hugely ineffective at many of the things that they might have done if they were to be supported by, as well as support, strong societies instead of weak societies, with strong, energetic citizens instead of weak, nervous, at some periods, terrified subjects. And that shouldn't be a, supply, a surprise, uh, if I can indulge a personal confession, because it seems implausible. If you look at me, I'm a, an obsessive swimmer. I try to do it every day. And I'm an uh, exponent. I'm not an exponent. I'm a, I learn a technique. And that technique, in the five years that I've been practicing it, we can, in q and I can tell you all about swimming, uh, is one which requires me from virtually every pore of my body to do something which was for me not natural. So I'm limited in some ways, but I'm actually a better swimmer than I once was. Boxers might think the same way. The limitations of a certain intelligent discipline are empowering and not disempowering, at least for the purpose for which we might hope the activity is, uh, is to be done. If you want to splash, don't learn to swim. You can splash on your own. But if you want to swim, learn to swim. So I think that analogy will help us along, at least. Uh, it does me. Now, how do we talk about that? A number of people from whom I've taken this emphasis on the positive significance of restraints of power, uh, look for terms for it. And I came across a term which works, I think, terrifically well in English. Two-thirds of it works in Polish. And I don't know how it works in other languages. I want to use a term which is actually, I was proud, terribly, boastfully proud of it for the first five minutes I came up with it until I realised that Bracton was ahead of me, Cicero was ahead of him, the Greeks were ahead of them. So all of them were ahead of me. The term I have in mind is tempering power. Bracton talks about tempering the power of the power holder. Cicero talks about, he translates from the Greek sophrosine, he translates it as temperantia, and from that we get the word in many European languages. It, among the Greeks, Temperant, well, sophrosyne is a virtue of character, moderation, lack of hubris, uh, balance, thoughtfulness, reflectiveness. And then Cicero expands it to be a virtue of institutions. If you've been to Siena, to the, uh, the three allegories of government, the allegory of good government is on one wall of the town hall in Siena, the allegory of bad government on another. And at the back there are the virtues of good government. And if you see there are seven of them, the three which are together are justice, the figure is holding the seven head of a felon. The third is magnanimita, throwing out coins to whoever wants. And the one in the middle is temperantia, governed by the slow passage of an hourglass. This is my interpretation because it's useful to me, but it seems to me it can't be accidental. And temperantia before that was illustrated by a mixing board. This notion of balance and mixing and thoughtfulness and, and, and moderation coming together is common. And this would work, it works in Polish, but the third, unfortunately, doesn't work in Polish and I don't know what other languages. Temp if you temper steel, in the English metaphor, you turn iron into steel by making it tougher but less brittle, tougher but less hard. You do it by balancing, bringing together a range of different elements. It's more resilient in the final product, more responsive, more useful, more apt for purpose, but not weaker. Anyway, the metaphor can go to hell, we don't need it, but I want to get that combination of moderation as not being simply a kind of cloud or manacle over power, but a sort of temperance. And one last point in sort of elaborating this, my story 
is this. If we think that tempering power, however we call it, is important, that arbitrary power is a, bad, is a serious problem and tempering power uh, uh, a step forward, one way to think of it, a common way to think of it, is that tempering power is a rule of law issue. And I want, following a, a very, uh, I think, distinguished and fertile Australian, I don't say buff Australian, I say Australian, social theorist, and, and uh, not theorist really, but writer on many forms of regulation, John Braithwaite, who said in response to me at one point, you're better off thinking of separation of the rule of law as a separation of powers issue than of the separation of powers as a rule of law issue. Why is that? And I've been thinking about that. The tempering power, as I'm going to use it as a shorthand bit, I hope you, you have a conception of what I'm talking about, even if you don't want the phrase, is the goal. It's a larger goal than whatever the means are to get it. The rule of law, or at least legal strategies towards that goal, are contingently, because it's not a priori, it's not a, in principle true, means that will help us get that goal. But if you're worried about arbitrary power, there are two things to keep in mind. First of all, it's not just states and ill-drafted laws which are the sources of arbitrary power. There are in the region I look at, there are uh, oligarchs in Russia, there are wrestlers, as they're called in Bulgaria, because they were wrestlers. Uh, there are tycoons in Croatia. There are businessmen in Poland. Or, what is the new term? Not so new term. Banksters. Banksters. Uh, and a controversy which, uh, which has just erupted in Poland uh, is an interesting illustration of that. In other words, and, and in a multi in a global world, we know that there are many other sources of power. ISIS, which was a state for a short time, but is not now. Al Qaeda. There are many non-state sources of significant and potentially harmful arbitrary power. And if the goal is to try to restrain that, then the goal I think of thought is to think about how that might be restrained, and that leads to my second point many sources of restraint will not be legal sources. So I want to suggest that the rule of law, or the point of the rule of law, the values to which the rule of law should be bent, are not just, and sometimes conceivably not even primary, legal ideals. They are social ideals, ideals for a society, and political ideals. Uh, uh, the sociologist Gianfranco Poggi, when he was trying to explain once Durkheim's uh, account of society, for Durkheim you could have a mass of people, but a society needs more than just people, it needs people who have common ways of acting and thinking. He said, society is an insofar as reality. A mass of people become part of one society insofar as they share certain common ways of acting and thinking, and culture and law and laws produced in it. I think of tempering power certainly in the rule of law derivatively as insofar social realities. You have them to the extent that in everyday life you don't have strong reason to fear that power is going to be exercised arbitrarily and you don't have strong experience in everyday life that it is exercised uh, arbitrarily. And a lot of my writing on this has been emphasising the sociological conditions, not just legal conditions, the sociological and political conditions necessary to think seriously about how one might temper power. So that's the story, for better or worse. But now to the Kant question. That's OK in theory, but what about practice? And in particular, since I gave a version of this talk a couple of times in Poland, uh, I wanted to answer what I feared suspected would be a question of many people's mind there. Oh, Kriegi goes on and on with his blah blah about society, etc. We've got a rule of law problem and that is that the government has taken over the constitutional court, first of all emasculated the existing court, then putting its own 
people into the court, then asking questions of the constitutional court, using it not as a source of check or balance, which was its original intention, but as a source of legitimacy because it knows what answers it will get because it's put in the people who run the agenda of the court. It's fused the procuracy, the procurator, with the uh, Minister of Justice. The same, uh, to use a technical term, psychopath, is in charge of both of those positions. It has, uh, as many people will know, in the last year and a half, conducted a sustained assault on the Supreme Court, uh, one element of which, which has just had a recent hiccup, was to get rid of some 40% of the court, that was the ambition, uh, by lowering the retirement age retrospectively from 70 to 65. As you probably know, uh, last week in a law, which was that law, and in typical po um, contemporary Polish fashion, took three hours to pass th all three readings in the, House of, in the lower House of Parliament, the uh, government has reversed those particular conditions in the hope of warding off action from the European Parliament, the uh, European Commission, and from the European Court of Justice. But they're still doing many other things. The ordinary courts are being changed. Uh, the, the press is under, uh, the, the public press has already been taken over completely and the private media are under attack, though they're still very independent. So many of these things, and in the public discussion in Poland, there has never been a moment, I believe, in Polish history that terms, Polish terms for the rule of law, have become so widely current. It's never been more than that. And partly that's because of sustained criticism by some extraordinary and, and publicly active lawyers. The Ombudsman, an extraordinary, extraordinary man, uh, Adam Bodnar, uh, a number of influential legal activists and academics. So somebody might say, look, we've just been listening to whatever it is of Credia, and what we have is the problem that we could have learned about from any lawyer, that they're trying to undermine the law by, uh, by attacks on it. I have a couple of answers. Or not answers, because uh, responses. One, it's important, even in this time of activity centred on courts and law in Poland and in the region, to remind oneself that many of the sources of arbitrary power which most hurt people in these societies have nothing much to do with the law. I mentioned Bank uh, There's a film which I recommend you see. It's not a great film, but it's a very powerful one, called The Clergy which is, uh, has just recently come out in Poland and has already had some three million Polish uh, uh, viewers and it's now, I think, in many languages it's appearing. It's about the arbitrary actions of uh, Polish clergy and the arbitrary ways in which those actions were covered up uh, in relation to pedophilia. Uh, and it's an extraordinary, it's extraordinary in this sense that it is as much about the activity of networks of priests and politicians and, and people with money as it is about the subject of the film. So that hasn't gone away. In post -com that's the general truth that these things, the networks are everywhere and some of them in some countries are sometimes support or in synchronisation with the activities of law, but sometimes they're not. Uh, but if we revert, if we turn to the law itself, what does this account, this sociologically point, this point-driven, sociologically inflected account, have to say to these intensely legal struggles? And I think it's good to look at that at the point of construction and destruction, because construction is from 1990 till a few years ago, destruction is what has been attempted, has already been largely achieved in it. Hungary is not achieved yet uh, in Poland, and these are not isolated cases in the region, they're exemplary. People are looking. At the constructive level, it seems to me uh, that the legal part of 
legal reform is not so hard. We have the laws. We know we can copy them. We can put them in. That's not a difficult part. Institutionalisation was an enormous challenge which nobody thought very much about. By institutionalisation, I follow uh, a concept, I mean, it's a, it's a word we know, but uh, Philip Selznick, of whom I've written, talked about institutionalisation as being a process whereby organisations or, or outfits are infused with value beyond the technical needs at hand. And he points out that in any long existing society, many institutions become institutionalised in that way. In Poland you think of the church, you think of the notion of the country, you may think of uh, um, other things which have been there for a very long time. It's not that Poland when, or any of these countries when reforms were initiated were blank slates. They had highly institutionalised loyalties, attachments, expectations. which People knew it were there but didn't think well, it might pose a problem. And then, particularly in the triumphal moment of the collapse of communism and the sense that there was only one option left around, nobody was thinking much about institutionalising the imported operations. These were rather matters of international best practice, which were to be emulated and applied. They were not thought of matters of local uh, attachment which was to be generated still because they were so novel, and not only novel, but often hostile to uh, existing ways of being. In a sense, the question I'm asking is why was the... Uh, and the question I would have asked with more confidence uh, three weeks ago, why has it been so easy for Orban and Kaczynski to do what Trump would love to do but finds more difficult to do? They each have a despised many institutions which stand in their way. But in, in Poland and Hungary, it has seemed to be, in Hungary it has been, very easy for them to ride over those institutions. Now that's not a matter of anything that I know that you learn from any of the standard accounts of the rule of law. It's a matter of an institutionalisation. Institutionalisation is a social and political matter. It's a matter of social activity, social loyalty to social attachments, which, in a sense, we know are there. We don't know how to deal with them. We don't think of them. When we're in the reform mode, we generate new uh, operations. Now, to generate, in, 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 if you think what it takes to be a flourishing person, it takes a lot. It takes conditions, it takes cultivation, it takes luck. If you think what it takes to kill somebody, it doesn't take, well, it might take something, but one thing might do it. And that's why I think that the attacks on the legal system in the destructive phase have been, uh, are so significant, and so worth watching. The populists of whom I am talking now, in a sense, know everything I've said much better than their antagonists did. They know all about institutionalisation. They know about institutionalised values, and they talk them up. They say these values have been maligned by these new forces imported from Europe, and you know what we think of Europe, and we reject them in honour of God, honour country. These are the, there's the Polish slogan and in Hungary there are similar slogans. So they rev up, they revive, they fill with an aura uh, values which the reformers didn't even know were a problem. But they also know it in a negative sense because they're determined to de-institutionalise anything that has been put in their way. I mentioned that Kaczynski has no government position, he just runs the country. When he attacked the Constitutional Court, his, t his party refused to publish judgments and refused to follow judgments. said, well, they're not really judgments. I mean, these were regular judgments. He said, they're not judgments. They're just a bunch of guys uh, chatting over coffee. 
That's how we treat them. And, I'm not an expert in this, but I'm struck by it, when Orban and his party attacked the Central European University, as far as I know in recent years, they have never used that term. They call it the Soros University. It's not a person, it's not an institution. So they know the significance of institutionalisation, both by pumping up earlier institutions and by attacking, by hollowing out existing institutions they don't approve of. Now one uh, spot of light has come into this picture recently in Poland, which is that the government has had to take some backward steps, largely driven by activities generated by lawyers. So again, is this a problem for my account which in a sense decenters the law from this ambition? It may be, but I think it's also compatible with it. We're in a paradoxical situation that the modern form of authoritarianism so far practiced in the region, I hope it's as bad as it gets, doesn't kill or imprison mass, it uses law. It seeks to show that it has legal legitimacy for what it does. So long as it keeps seeking to do that, lawyers are in a particularly significant moment, which they aren't always when there are authoritarians on the rampage. And so lawyers, in the Polish example, are right to be as active as they are. What they are arguing about is important, but not quite for the reasons that they give. They have these constant legal battles, as you'd imagine, does Article 7 authorise this? Is there something wrong with an act which uh, uh, reduces the, the uh, age of retirement? They do that, but if they do only that, they can't win f both because ordinary people aren't interested in those provisions, and secondly, they won't always win those arguments. Is Hungary closer to the ideal of the rule of law than Poland? Because given that the Hungarian government has an... Uh, 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 absolute majority, constitutional majority, constitutional majority, it can do everything it does legally. Does that make it closer to the rule of law than Poland? I think not. That's not the issue. The issue for me, the issue which is important to get out there as a social and political matter, just as much as a legal matter, is that the point of the rule of law, the, the restraint on arbitrary use of power, is what is at stake what is being undermined by these people, and uh, what should be affirmed. Thanks very much. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the difference between tempering arbitrary power and institutionalizing power. Anything can be institutionalized. You can institutionalize Nazism, and it was done. You can institutionalize bestiality, and it's been done. Uh, tempering power depends on that, those values and ways of doing it being institutionalised. Institutionalisation is a condition for the, endure, the durability and the social and political significance of uh, certain activities, whatever they be. But, <coughs> as I say, things can be institutionalised which have nothing to do with institutions. For example, in Poland, uh, this is true of many parts of the region, but in Poland, given they had a history of 120 years of partition, not having their own state, then a brief period of, very brief period, a few years of democracy, then 
an internal dictatorship in Nazism or communism, there is not a deal of affection for the state and for law. In fact, that lack of affection is deeply institutionalized. People uh, are surprised, and part of the move in the last, however deep it is, I can't say, but the sense that somehow in recent year and a half, a wider public has come to feel that something is at stake in this lawyer's bloodline is a big change. And whether, is this institutionalised in some significant way? I can't tell. Uh, was its opposite institutionalised and is it still in a whole range of... It's, you know, these aren't the worst people in the world, the people who come to public. But if you're in a, in a debate on a hot topic that is uh, in July, whether the president, whether the parliament should pass these amended laws allowing the sacking of, of uh, some judges. There was quite a lot of heat in the parliament, so just like this, the speaker reduces the amount of time opposition members can speak to 30 seconds. Then that's not enough, 10 seconds. That's not enough, turns off the microphones. Now, this is not a terrified population, I and mean, that you can understand. But it is a society where proceduralism is not institutionalised. So institutionalisation can, can certainly mask this. I'm going to force you to pay a price for not defining the rule of law, which is a polite way of saying that I'm about to demonstrate my own ignorance of exactly what that may mean. And that is, <clears throat> imagine a situation in which we have a perfect democracy. We have something which meets all of the criteria. We have an informed population, we have an independent judiciary, we have a, an unbiased and an uncorrupted administration that passes and in fact constitutionalizes a rule of law which prejudices a minority of the population, 1%. And that could range everything from slavery to, you refer to bestiality, to how we treat sentient beings we call animal or foodstuff. And <clears throat> if, all of the, if all of the criteria of the rule of law are met, and there is therefore no overriding principle, no, no external planet being that descends on us that say, but there's something fundamentally wrong here, you're exercising this against and prejudicing the rights. There are no rights because the population fully informed with their judiciary interpreting that law in an unbiased manner are doing so in all of the manners that meet the criteria of the rule of law. You will get to a point where saying there is no point to that rule of law, that somehow there's something fundamentally wrong, but it still meets what at first I thought was your rhetorical question but can become a real question in that hypothetical situation. Can you educate? <laughs> That's a deep question, and it's a, it's, it's a common question by which I don't mean it. I mean, it's common in the sense that it goes to the heart of, of a lot of thinking about the rule of law. And I've got a, an answer which is easier for me, so I'll start with that, but then I'll try to do something which is more, or I try to suggest something a bit more problematic because I think, I don't think there's an easy resolution to the question of that. So the easy one for me is to say, look, I said three things, uh, um, uh, uncontrolled, unpredictable, but also unrespectful. And I can just expand, if I wanted to just rhetorically to get out of your net, I could just say, look, I, in the written version, I mentioned that there may be a fourth, because we think of, uh, unjustified, of course that needs a story so discrimination among people as arbitrary. If blacks aren't allowed into a university, that's arbitrary, but if uh, people with a very poor record of academic achievement aren't allowed, we say that's not arbitrary, there's a, good, there's a reason for that, but there's no reason for the other. So I could in a sense say, well, your example can be taken by my third plus fourth. 
But I want. I, I'm not satisfied by that answer because then really there's almost no, nothing I can't escape. Uh, in the in traditional thinking, this has been at the heart of debates between what are called proponents of thin theories of the rule of law and thick theories of the rule of law, formal, substantive. And comparative political scientists, also businessmen and other people, like thin theories. The, the rule of law is just a certain institutional arrangement. Because, and they don't, they say it's good for some purposes, it's a limited good, uh, but it's compatible conceivably with precisely the sorts of evils that you describe. And that just shows us that the rule of law is a limited uh, good, but still might be good in many circumstances. The thick theorists uh, say, no, no, you don't have the rule of law unless you have an institutionalized regard for some substantive agenda, which might include human rights as the, maybe just civil or political rights, maybe social and economic rights, etc. The danger at that level, uh, with that response, which has been pointed out many times, is that if the rule of law is the rule of the good, we've lost any distinctiveness in the concept. We already know that things should be good, uh, or that we want justice. My still inadequate response to your question, which is actually an attempt to respond to that question, is to choose neither of these options. I think if the rule of law is just the good, and then anything that you have in a system is not good, you say, well, that's inconsistent with the rule of law, well, then the rule of law ceases to do, do any good. If it's just institutions, there are many reasons I think that's not good. What I wanted, what I've said little about today, is the debate, as you frame it, and as it's often framed, is what does the rule of law do for the general good? That's not how you put it, but maybe it could be paraphrased there. I want to suggest that there is a domain of activity, which is the exercise of power, which deserves focus. It's not, every, it's not everything we should be interested in. It's not the source of, it's not the location or source of all goods and bads. But it's significant in itself, how power is exercised, and that's where I focus. And uh, it's conceivable that power might be exercised in ways that are kosher, but still things fall out of, still bad things can happen. And I think, yeah, well, that is conceivable. But no one good is every good. And so I want to say, to the extent that power is tempered, uh, a, a great deal has been achieved, but not everything that you might want can be achieved just through that means. And you will have room for a separate argument about the, uh, the results of the exercise of power. Uh, I think that with my three-part exemplification by definition. Uh, I can, I should cut out many of those because power which is, un, which is controlled, reliable and respectful covers quite a lot of good ground, I think. But you're right, it may not cover all good and uh, it's, to that extent it's not, it's not a universal, I'm sorry, maybe universal good but it's not good for everyone. Thank you, Professor, uh, for your presentation, which was uh, very interesting, uh, although for me a little bit subjective. Uh, and I would like to uh, make one comment and challenge you on one issue you mentioned. Uh, at the very end of your presentation, uh, you mentioned that uh, in Hungary there's a two-third majority in Parliament. Uh, that there's a two-third majority in the Hungarian Parliament. Uh, and I don't know if everybody around uh, here knows, but as you mentioned, in the constructive phase after 1990, uh, the constitution was created to have some legislation which can be only changed if there's a two-third majority in the parliament. 
These are the important questions for the entire society. The surprising thing for the Western world currently is that in Hungary, for the third time in a row, there's a government with a two-third majority. Before that, it was not the case, so there was no possibility to change these legislations. Uh, in my view, uh, and in the government's view, having the ability of changing legislation with two-third majority is not against the Constitution. It is exactly what the Constitution requires to change these laws. Whether the change we like or we dislike, that's a, that's a question of values, but it's not a question of institution or legal uh, proficiency. It's a question of values that we can debate, of course, but we have to agree on disagree, as you also mentioned. And if I may challenge you on one question, and it was your last sentence, is the Central European University. For me, uh, the rule of law also means, as you also mentioned, I believe, transparency, uh, level playing field, uh, equal opportunities, uh, and you can name it. The Hungarian legislation on education requires from universities wishing to issue double degrees, Hungarian German, Hungarian Malaysian, Hungarian American, to offer uh, education in both countries. There are 17 universities offering double degrees in Hungary, 16 of them offers education in both of the countries. There is one exception, it's the Central European University. I don't understand why requiring the same, which is in legislation, from one university, which is already done by all the others, is not part of the rule of law in your, in your views. Thank you. It's true that our disagreement, as I appear it is, uh, is a matter of, in part, values, which doesn't necessarily make it subjective, because one can have legitimate disagreement uh, on values, and some values are rightly uh, to be rejected. And at least many people have thought that about many egregious examples of arbitrary power in the region, I think it's down in the etc. It's true, subjectively, I don't like them very much, but I don't think it's just a subjective opinion. Uh, the, uh, on your first point about the two-third majority, yes, it's true that the government can do, can make a new constitution because there was not a new constitution, uh, there was not a made constitution after 1989, but just a flurry of amendments which went in consistent directions. But the government could make a constitution and it did so in a rather dramatically untransparent and unconsultative manner. Uh, that constitution having come into place, that constitutional majority having come into place, means that it is consistent with a certain sort of a counter-democracy which sees it purely as plebiscitarian, or sorry, but more precisely, sees democracy as achieved when the majority's representatives have power. Now, it seems to me that, uh, to come back to the earlier question, one thing that this gentleman was made, uh, mentioned was opinion formation. It's, I think there's very good reason to say that opinion formation is uh, undermined by a whole range of the Hungarian government's uh, attacks on private media, on NGOs, on independent activities, and on the courts. The CEU, and this is not my expertise, I live a long way away, but this, it is my understanding, and I have followed it to the best of my ability, has been seeking to negotiate, has had uh, an acceptance agreement by the uh, state of New York, by universities within the state, for uh, the teaching and the activity of the CEU in New York. Preposterous questions, it seems to me. I mean, preposterous demands, because uh, the CEU's primary activity since its inception is clearly in Hungary. But it has done a great deal in response to that. It has not always had a welcoming response from the government, or even 
any negotiations, as I understand it, have been available between the rector of the CAU, C, CAU, not quite, uh, <laughs> CEU and, and, and Mr. Orban, even though, as I understand, Ignacio has sought these many times. So, on the institutional facts, uh, we differ. Uh, no doubt you know them much more closely than I do, but that's not my reading of them. But just to draw to the point, my question is not about a legal statement. I mean, the Hungarian government with its two third majority can put whatever it likes in the list. My question is a political and moral one, so as you say, subjective. To what extent does do the reforms of the last, uh, since 2010 give the government access to, and do it systematically and deliberately, the ability to exercise power arbitrarily over a wide swathe of subjects in a wide swathe of way. My assessment is these reforms, however legal in form, all tend, not all, to a remarkable attempt, extent tend in that direction. So my uh, assessment of them is these violate directly, systematically, deliberately, cumulatively, the point of the rule of law, even if they may never violate the letter. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I have a question which is slightly different, which relates to legal theory, I would imagine. What is your position regarding the secular post-colonial law which exists in most post-colonial societies as compared to traditional law which also exists in those societies? And examples come from uh, Arab and Muslim countries where there may be a conflict between the secular post-colonial law and the desire by important groups to introduce the Sharia law at an equal level. And finally, a little question to you. I come from Pakistan. We have a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who is tearing society apart in terms of those who love him and those who hate him because he's doing things like saying, um, we don't have enough dams in this society to give the right of everybody to water. Therefore, the hell with the government uh, structure that is supposed to be delivering on this human right. I, as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, I'm going to establish a fund, and people have been giving a lot of money to this fund. Is this uh, justice in your, in, in your view? I mean, I, I would like to have your reaction to these questions. Thank you. Uh, on the first one, I think this is a slew of problems, not one of them. Mm. And a, fl a slew of circumstances, not one circumstance. Uh, I. One can look at it instrumentally, as a lot of rule of law promotion does, or pragmatically in a small brief sense, what works. And uh, the fact is, when cosmopolitan local elites or colonial elites. Uh, come to a country where they are legal reformers, or even more when they're settlers, they uh, often ignore, typically have ignored uh, indigenous beliefs, practices, norms, and laws. And at a pragmatic level, it seems to me, you know, the logic of my argument is, that's got to have huge perils. Even if you don't like what's there, that's there, and it is going to affect and, and 
undermine what it is that we have to in mind to do. At a moral level, uh, political level, it's also often going to combine arrogance and ignorance in um, salutary ways. <coughs> Though I sometimes have mixed feelings. Uh, there is a nice book on Sudan by a young uh, American scholar and Sudanese who goes to the refugees with him called, uh, his name is Mark Masood, and it's called Laws fragile state. And it really surveys the development of law from the British imposition through the brief period of democracy, through uh, the, the subsequent uh, despotisms and civil wars. And he's caught with the sort of dilemma that we've been talking about. Law was imposed in all these times. And sometimes he slips to saying, and the rule of law was imposed in all these times, and look what it comes up with. And then human rights activists come in now and offer advice at making the legal system, central legal system, more effective. And it turns out that since a source of some legitimacy for the dictators has been the legal stuff in place, they're happy to receive this, so you have this kind of... And yet, and this is... The talk that I was going to give... Sorry, the, the talk I was going to give was going to be called, originally, To and From the Rule of Law. And part of it was why I had found the Rule of Law so appealing, as because it dealt with a problem that I found so oppressive and distasteful, but then increasingly this kind of sociological trajectory, which includes take account of what exists in the connection, was leading me away from the law. So that was a need to and from, it was a better title than the one you had. Uh, but I started to think, particularly because of the policy situation, look more than others and so forth. And I felt, reading this book on Sudan, that the British, who were arrogant, supercilious, uh, uh, offering, uh, offer brutal and, and, and condescending, nevertheless had some ideas that the judge should not just be told what to do. They were carrying some of this stuff, and so in the book itself, Masood says, when the dictators took over from the Democrats, their first attacks were on these elements of the court, so that the court would be part of the administrative hierarchy of the system without any conception of it seemed to me the whole story is a sad story, but this was a particular moment which was even sadder. And so, Shalini and, and Deval would know much better than I how to tell the story of India, uh, which is fearsomely complicated and in many ways has all of those terrible features that I've just outlined, but it's not um remedied by some, not remedied, um, it's not unpopulated by some conceptions of restraint of tempering of power which seem to be precious. So this is a typical slimy way of getting out of a question that you don't quite know how to answer. But that, that's that one. I'm, I'm even slimy on the second question because I don't know, I don't know anything about the facts. But it relates to what is, I mean it may just be either an abuse of power or or, uh, or a, a, a particularly effective use of a certain position given that other options are closed. I simply don't know that. But it does relate to a very long standing debate about the rule of law, which is not concluded and, and may never be. Whether the rule of law should be, as Justice Anthony Scalia once had as a title of an article, the rule of law as the law of rules, or whether the rule of law is compatible with a more politically and socially and maybe even morally open response to some of the problems which come before the court. Uh, I once heard a lecture by the chief, well, the ex-chief justice, but he was ex in a civilized way, he's still there, uh, of, of uh, Colombia. Manuel Cepeda, a remarkable man and a remarkable judge. 
And he told the story of uh, his court, which was only invented by the constitutional, by the new constitution of, I think, 1992. It has extraordinary sway in the country, a country which is devastated by civil war for a very long period of time. I gave a talk uh, in February to that court. There were this many people in the audience, but they asked, would I uh, allow Facebook, um, whatever. And I said, sure, I didn't. And, and so once it was on Facebook, I, I picked it up, I put it on my Facebook. I only have two friends. So my two friends answered, but then I looked at the at the Facebook. The end of the first day, there were four thousand likes, and, not, and at the end of the second day, nine thousand. And that was a sort of, you know, I don't know a court that has that significance. But what, and, and I don't fully understand it. I guess in some aspects of it. So Pena was telling the story of forms of judgment which were generated unprecedentedly by the Colombian court, which required, for example, a matter of housing, rights to housing, etc., that the court set up monitoring procedures and reports back to the court, <coughs> all the sort of stuff which, in a regular Anglo-Saxon court at least, and most courts in the West would seem absolutely inappropriate. And somebody asked him, did you have a precedent for this? Did you know, did you have, and he said, well, I didn't have a precedent, but we have a problem. And so I don't want to give some, I don't have an all-purpose answer to that. All the more because I then asked the question, uh, my love affair with Philip Sosnick has already been announced here, but uh, a man I admired greatly, who wrote a book with a uh, student and then colleague, Philip Monet, called Law and Society in Transition Toward Responsive Law. And he argued for the possibility of law which did more than simply apply rules, but was another institution in the mix of institutions dealing with complex social problems. And I said diffidently, because I didn't think Mr. Pedder would know, uh, did you have intellectual sources? Because a lot of what you said sounded a bit like what Selznick calls towards responsive, it calls responsive law in the book for its society tradition. And in a moment which had my heart rise out of my body, I love that book, I love that book. I wanted to translate it into Spanish and then something like this. So, I sit on another fence here. I don't, um, if judges do what they have no expertise or authority given to them, but expertise is important in social problems, then I'm worried about it. But if uh, I'm not worried, uh, if within a certain environment, judges are not simply the legal automator of a certain sort of um, caricature of conflict. So that's another weasel answer that we have. I think if you'll allow me, we'll close the uh, formal Q&A here. Thank you very, very much. This uh, The last set of questions brings us to uh, something which um, uh, has been a perennial debate in, in and about the Indian Supreme Court, about the reach of the court and whether it is acting in domains which uh, uh, are problematic or not, and the, uh, this has been one. The other uh, were a question that you were addressing about uh, customary law, etc. Uh, Afghanistan would be a wonderful uh, example to look at the ulema courts which the Taliban has set up, right? So we have a very odd instance of extremely expensive rule of law uh, machinery instituted by foreign donors with no institutionalization and completely irrelevant to the lives of people, paralleled by uh, uh, these um, legal, juridical, plus religious leaders, the ulamas, trained by the Taliban. And interestingly, uh, if you uh, talk to uh, the people, they will say these judges are impartial. I mean, of course, they share the language with the people, so it's much easier to understand people are familiar with what they're doing. But they say, so the criteria of impartiality becomes very interesting, that these ulama are rotated off 
from one district to the other by the Taliban periodically so that they do not get involved in any local issues. So impartiality is about how to maintain this um, institution uh, without any local connections. Uh, so, so there are, you can have very, very, I think we could have had, uh, if we had had the time to go into some very interesting questions which you've just uh, raised towards the end of the discussion. But I would like to thank you, close here for now. Thank you very, very much for being uh, with us the, this evening. And uh, just look at our web page of the uh, center, um, as well as we have a Twitter um, account here, which is the hashtag dismantling uh, rule of law. Uh, and uh, we'll keep you posted about uh, our next uh, lectures in uh, the coming term. I think January we are still on vacation uh, in the sense of the, the series is on vacation uh, because uh, the students are on vacation, but we return in February. 18th? Michael Ignatiev is in February. So Michael Ignatiev, the um, uh, rector of the CEU, will be our next speaker, as they will rightly reminds me. He'll be talking about uh, the rule of law, but he'll also be talking about uh, academic freedom and uh, autonomy. Uh, and we'll be dealing with some of the same kinds of questions which have been addressed to you towards the end. So with that, I'd like to wish you a um, happy end to this year and hope to see you next year with us. Thank you very much.